Hello. My name is Nick, and I'm gonna be the next school shooter of 2018. Right, going to die. Can't wait. Nine one one. What is your emergency? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What's happening? Nicholas Jacob Cruz was born on September 24, 1998 in Margate, Florida and was adopted at birth by Roger and Linda Cruz. He was six years old when his father died in 2004 and a few months after he turned 19, his mother also died in 2017. Three months and a half later, Nicholas committed the massacre that will make him known worldwide. Cruz displayed behavioral issues early on in middle school and this caused him to move from one school to another. He went through the transfer process six times in three years until he got into a school for children with emotional or learning disability. It has been reported that he made threats towards other students. In 2016, he returned to Stoneman Douglas High School, but the following year he was expelled for disciplinary reasons and he ended up being transferred to another school. What's interesting to note is the fact that the institution prohibited him of wearing a backpack on school premises. State investigators concluded that he had depression, autism, and ADHD. He had previously received mental health treatment, but he had not received treatment in the year leading up to the school shooting. In February 2017, Cruz legally purchased an AR-15 style semi-automatic rifle from a Coral Springs gun store after having passed the required background check. At that time in Florida, it was legally permitted for people as young as 18 to purchase chase guns from federally licensed dealers, including the rifle allegedly used in the shooting. On February 14, 2018, 19-year-old Nicholas Cruz took an Uber to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. He entered the 1200 building with a case rifle and a backpack. The building was a three-story structure containing 30 classrooms, typically occupied by around 900 students and 30 teachers. He was charging his rifle on the hallway when a student accidentally bumped into him, and Cruz urged the freshman named Christopher McKenna to run as things were about to get bad. I walked into a man. He was wearing a, uh, a maroon shirt with a JROTC shirt with a backpack and a hat on, black pants, he had a rifle in his hands. I walked, I was, I kept, I was stunned for one second, and he said to me, get out of here, things are about to get bad. And I walked through the double doors, I sprinted as fast as I can, I was, I was in the room, in the staircase for about seven seconds, and I ran out and I ran to the north side gates, by was called their senior lot. And I ran into Coach Vice. Cruz entered the hallway and began firing at students. Gina Montalto, Luke Hoyer, and Martin Duque were hit. Soon after, the sound of a fire alarm going off was heard by everyone, but it is uncertain if the shooter pulled it or if it simply went off due to the gunfire smoke. Because there had already been a fire drill earlier that morning, people were confused and they were not really sure what had to be done. Many of the students did not even realize that what was happening was real. When he runs out, the defendant enters the first floor hallway and when he enters the first floor hallway there are four students in the hallway he gets out and he fires his weapon at the four students in the hallway the time 221 33 221 33 the massacre Begins. Cruz then proceeds to the classrooms. He first fires in room 1216, shooting and killing Alexander Schachter, who was still sitting at his desk. Cruz then puts his tactical vest on, recharges the rifle, and goes over to room 1215, where the first three students were hit. He shoots and kills them. He then fires in room 1214, and he kills Helena Ramsey and Nick Dworet. He wounds Samantha Brady, Samantha Fuentes, Isabel Checker, and Daniela Menesca. 
Pascal. Cruz returns to the first room he shot, which was 1216. Firing again, he kills Alyssa Aladef and Elena Petty. He wounds Justin Colton, William Olson, Genesis Valentine, Keshava Managapuram, and Alexander Dorit, which was Nicholas Dorit's brother. He leaves the hall and bumps into Chris Hickson, which he shoots and injures badly. Cruz goes back to where he came from and while passing the first three students he now has shot twice, he fires a third time. Going to room 1213, he fires through the glass door window and kills Carmen Shentra. He wounds Madeline Wilford, Samantha Mayer, and Benjamin Wikander. Cruz goes back and again he passes Chris Hickson which he shoots again. Continuing to go to the stairwell door, he encounters coach Aaron Feiss, which he shoots and kills. As the shooter goes up the stairwell, at the second floor, the students and the teachers heard the shots from the first floor and they also heard the shots from the stairwell. So they already began shutting off the lights and making sure that all the rooms are closed and locked. Cruz fires into room 1234 and 1231, but luckily there was no one there. He then heads to the stairwell to go up to the third floor. The students and teacher here did not hear the noise but they did hear the fire alarm going off so they were proceeding to evacuate. They were out of the classrooms, some on the west stairwell, others on the east stairwell and that's when they heard the gunshots so they ran back up and tried to get into the classrooms. Cruz reached the third floor and he noticed teacher Scott Beagle which was helping students get into the room 1256. The shooter fires four times and kills him. The next classroom is 1255, where teacher Stacy Lapel was getting the students inside. Cruz shoots and wounds her, but she does manage to close the door to the room. The shooter continues to fire his rifle into the hallways, shooting Meadow Pollack and Carol Lofren, which retreat in room 1249. Also, Kyle Leman, Marian Kabachenko, and Anthony Borges were wounded. Hawkin Oliver was running down the stairs when he got shot, but retreats to the alcove of the men's restroom. Jamie Guttenberg was also running down the hall and she got shot. Peter Wang was heading to the stairwell door to run down and he was also shot. Cruz goes by room 1249 where he shoots Meadow Pollack and Carol Lofren again. Cruz then passes by the alcove of the men's restroom and shoots Hawkin Oliver again, this time killing him. He walks down the hall and shoots Peter Wang again and this is the crazy part, the kid was shot 13 times. Can you imagine that? Jamie Guttenberg managed to reach the stairwell door, but she collapsed and died before managing to exit the building. Cruz wanted more, so he actually tried to shoot people from a window. These people were running outside and they were trying to get away from the school. Luckily, he was not successful in this. He then goes to the stairwell, passes by Peter Wang, passes by Jamie Guttenberg, and near her, he places his vest and rifle on the ground, and then he starts running and blending in with the other students that were trying to get away from the school. One of the students fleeing the scene actually talked to him during the attempt to get to a safe place. We went along all the way here, just about here is when I had turned around and I saw the shooter was standing behind me. I said hi, he said hi back and I said, you know, do you have any college plans? And he said, somewhere in Florida. The girl you just saw did not know at the time that she was talking to the person that had ended the life of so many of her colleagues and teachers. She's obviously still shaken up about the events four years later. Nicholas Cruz managed to get away and he stopped at a mall to get something to drink. Then he walked into a fast food restaurant to get something to eat. And there he stayed up until 3 p.m. when he finally left. 40 minutes later, he was apprehended by the police. This killing spree was at that time the deadliest high school shooting in the United States history, surpassing the Columbine school shooting that killed 15, including the perpetrators, in Colorado in April 1999. The shooting lasted for six minutes in total and all the students and teachers were shot in less than four minutes. Cruz killed 17 people and he injured another 17. Lisa Aladev, 14 years old. She was the captain of the Parkland Soccer Club and on March 7, 2018, nearly three weeks after the shooting, she was honored by the United States Women's National Soccer Team. Scott Beagle, 35 years old. 
geography teacher Scott Beagle was killed after he unlocked the classroom for students to enter and hide from crews. Martin Duque, 14 years old. Friends describe him as one of the kindest people they knew and he will be missed by his brother as well. Nicholas Dwarret, 17 years old. He was a swimmer that had already been accepted by the University of Indianapolis through a scholarship. Aaron Feist, 37 years old. He was an assistant football coach and security guard and was killed as he was trying to get into the school and see how he can help. Jamie Guttenberg, 14 years old. She was a freshman and a talented dancer that was always defending the bullied students. Chris Hickson, 49 years old. Chris Hickson was the school's athletic director and was killed as he ran toward the sound of gunfire and tried to help fleeing students. Luke Hoyer, 15 years old. He loved basketball and he was also looking forward to joining the football team at Douglas in the fall. Carol Lofram, 14 years old. She was an excellent student who loved the beach. Her brother Liam was also in the school premises, but he was not wounded during the shooting. Gina Montalto, 14 years old. She was studying in the hallway to better concentrate away from the typical noise in the classroom when crews shot her. She was a smart, loving, energetic young girl. Joaquin Oliver, 17 years old. He had just gotten his US citizenship and his friends were heartbroken for not being able to graduate together. Elena Petty, 14 years old. She loved surfing and she was part of the team that helped people clean and rebuild after Hurricane Irma. Meadow Pollack, 18 years old. Meadow was a senior who was shot four times. As crews fired into other classrooms, Pollack crawled to a classroom door but was unable to get inside. Carol Lofran, a freshman, was alongside Pollock and Pollock covered Lofran in an attempt to shield her from the bullets. The shooter returned to the classroom and located Pollock and Lofran, discharging his weapon five more times and killing both girls. Helena Ramsey, 17 years old. Before the shooter targeted their classroom, Helena told students to get books and use them to cover their heads. She was a great student and a very loving person. Alex Schachter, 14 years old. He played trombone and baritone. A scholarship fund in his name was started by his family. His brother also survived the shooting. Carmen Shentrop, 16 years old, was a National Merit Scholarship Program semi-finalist, a very friendly person, always with a smile on her face. Peter Wang, 15 years old. Student Peter Wang was last seen in his junior reserve officer's training corps uniform, holding doors open so others could get out more quickly. Wang was unable to flee with the students when Cruz appeared and fatally shot him. As I was telling you earlier, 17 other students were shot but managed to survive. Here are some of the testimonies of what happened to them. Then I decided to turn my head and look behind me. And then I seen my friend Helena and it, it wasn't a very good situation. Um, she didn't look like she kind of survived. I didn't feel anything at that point. I didn't feel pain. The, ambulance person were just like, oh, it was a through and through. I didn't really grasp what that meant. I'm like, through and through, okay, sure. I hear three shots in the hallway, like the loudest noise you've ever heard, from the back of my head. And so we start looking around the room, we scan, and everyone kind of just pauses, but like gives this silent look to each other. From underneath, from behind this wooden podium that I now hunched over, and I see him. He's standing there in the window. And then I see um, my friend Nick. Nick is now on the grounds, uh, like wedged between like the floor and his backpack. He was shot overtly in the head and was killed instantly. To the left of him was Helena. She was shot overtly in the chest, killed instantly. And I look down and I've gone shot. And I look above my left knee and I see that there's a huge hole there. And I look at the rest of my legs and there's like, like little like holes in them and then the little holes are covered in blood. Where where were you shot? In my leg, my other leg and the back. And over right. here in the RP. Right. Right. Can you can you show it to us? Oh yeah, sure. Thank you. And uh, how many surgeries have you had? 
As of July 18, 2022, Nicholas Cruz's sentencing phase has begun. He pleaded guilty in an attempt to receive life in prison instead of the death penalty. The jury has witnessed the testimonies of many people present at the scene. What struck me the most in this case is the fact that prior to the shooting, there were an incredible amount of warning signs. Cruz's online profiles and social media were full of at least disturbing posts involving violence, racism, homophobia, and much more. At one point, he left a comment on a YouTube video stating that he will be a famous shooter. The owner of that channel actually reported the comment to the FBI, but they were not able to do anything as they didn't have enough evidence. It is probably naive to think that this behavior does not go unnoticed by the police or the authorities. Unfortunately, we saw this happen time and time again. Related to Nicholas Cruz, there were multiple reports from people around him that that he was planning a school shooting, that he was acquiring guns, and that he was an immediate danger. From 2008 until 2017, at least 45 calls were made in reference to Cruz, his brother, or his family home situation. On February the 5th, 2016, the calls included an anonymous tip that Cruz had threatened to shoot up a school, and on November 30th, 2017, that he might be a school shooter in the making, and that he collected knives and guns. On January the 5th, 2018, less than two months before the shooting, the FBI received the tip on its public access line from a person who was close to Cruz. On February 16, two days after the shooting, the agency released a statement that detailed this information. According to the statement, the caller provided information about Cruz's gun ownership, desire to kill people, erratic behavior, and disturbing social media posts, as well as the potential of him conducting a school shooting. After conducting an investigation, the FBI said that the tip line did not follow the protocol when the information was not forwarded to the Miami field office. On May 30th, 2018, the prosecutors released three videos that they claim Cruz had recorded on his cell phone before the shooting. In the videos, Cruz appears to be describing his feelings, his enthusiasm and plan for the shooting, his hatred of people and how this action will make him notorious. An extract of one of those is exactly what you saw at the beginning of this video. There have also been multiple irregularities between what should have happened in the event of a school shooting and how it all went down. There were reports of security guards on school premises that did not intervene and didn't try to stop crews. There have also been disputes regarding the response time of the police. In March 2018, the Florida legislature passed a bill called the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Public Safety Act. It raised the minimum age of of buying rifles to 21, it also established waiting periods and background checks, and provided a program for the arming of some school employees and hiring of school police. In the aftermath of the massacres, students and teachers suffered from PTSD, and two of them ended their own lives in the year that followed. Some of the survivors pursued careers in criminal law or in the medical field. The tragedy that these kids had to live through is unthinkable. They saw friends and teachers lose their lives. They feared that they were not going to see their families again. And many of the messages that were sent from inside the school to relatives or siblings conveyed just that. Some kids were asking their mothers to forgive them for everything that they did wrong. Others were just trying to say just how much they loved them. And some were simply terrified and they were asking for help. In the interrogation of Nicholas Cruz, there were some statements from the shooter that he was hearing voices and that he could not control his actions because of that. The interrogators reported that he seemed to be faking mental illness and they were not convinced by his behavior at all. They actually thought that he was capable of understanding the gravity of what he did. On the 4th of August, the jurors responsible of deciding Nicholas Cruz's fate visited Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. The 1200 building. This location has been preserved intact since the shooting that happened four years ago. The gruesome crime scene seems to be frozen in time. There are still marks in the walls from the bullets that were shot from the AR. All the glass windows that were broken are still there. The personal effects of the children that witnessed this tragedy are exactly as they were left that day. The jurors saw the blood on the walls on the floors, they saw Valentine's Day cards soaked in blood that has since dried out. There are teddy bears 
and deflated balloons still, and laptops on desks full of debris. That scene was not an easy one to take in by the jurors, I believe. Along with all the testimonies of the survivors, those of the families that lost their children, and the friends of the victims, the jurors now have all the pieces of the puzzle and a clear overall image of how the event took place. When I started researching this case, I had a shred of empathy for Cruz, knowing that he had lost his parents, both of them, and this can be traumatizing, especially for a kid. But the more I read about how he planned all of this, and the more I listened to the survivor's stories, I can't help but feel that he really does deserve everything that is coming his way. But tell me what do you guys think? Do you feel like he should get life in prison, or do you think that maybe he deserves the death penalty? Do you believe that he acted without fully comprehending what he was doing, or do you feel like he was just pure evil, and he knew what tragedies he was creating in the lives of all present at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas that day. Please leave a comment down below and share your opinion. Thank you for watching this video. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.